Welcome. Um, today we're uh, going to have three presenters, and it's on Design Guide 31, which is uh, cast castellated and cellular beam design. Um, just a quick update, the design guide has been printed. Uh, I hear there are a few copies at the conference. We don't have them at the moment, but if you stop by the AISC booth later, we may have a couple copies there if you want to come by, thumb through it, check it out. It will be on the website available for download in the next couple weeks. So uh, you, you make an email blast that it's now available, but keep your eyes peeled uh, and you'll be able to download it. If you're a member, you'll be able to download it for free. Um, our, speakers, our speakers today are uh, Dave Deinhart with Villanova, uh, Sam Ferris with uh, New Millennium, and John uh, Colson with uh, Integrity Structural. Um, and I'll let Dave take it from here. Thank you, Joe. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we appreciate uh, you guys getting here on time because anybody who comes in late is going to get a quiz at the end of today. So we appreciate you coming. Uh, really, this has uh, been a labor of love for uh, many years for the three of us. Um, and it was, it was a, I guess I uh, welled up a little bit when I saw the cover for the first time in PDF form. Um, and I still haven't got a copy of the design guide either. So um, if you guys beat me to the um, AISC booth, you might actually get a copy before the authors do. The idea behind the, doc the, the, the design guide was to document and detail state of the practice for the design of castellated and cell beams in the US. Um, and part of the reason for the delay is it actually does conform to the 2017 the new spec. Here is a synopsis of what is in it. So there's a, a brief introduction, some of which you'll see today, um, some discussion on applications, uh, which uh, John will be able to walk you through, um, detailed design procedures, and then probably what will be of the most use to you are design examples. And both the procedures and the examples detail non-composite castellated and cellular beam and composite um, use of the products as well. Um, I think the authors, uh, as we put a lot of time into this, Sam has um, over 31 years of industry experience, uh, a good portion of that, over a third of it, um, in designing and researching castellated and cellular beams with both uh, CMC and New Millennium. Uh, he's also, I've had the fortune uh, to have him as a, as a master's student at Villanova, and he currently is uh, doing his doctoral program part-time um, from Arkansas which is uh, impressive that he has time to do that. Uh, John, I think we were, we were reminiscing and, and we met over castellated beams in the late 90s. Um, so John's got, he's a principal at Integrity Structural, over 22 years of experience um, designing real things, uh, 12 years uh, on the castellated cellular beam side um, and numerous licenses throughout the country. Uh, I have uh, a background in industry. I worked with Bechtel for a few years. Um, I have an avid basketball fan that is in mourning right now. Um, but I'm a, a professor at Villanova. I've been at Villanova almost 20 years. Um, over half of that has been looking at castellated and cellular beams um, on an experimental and analytical um, front. And I just had some freshmen this past week presenting their freshman projects, and they were actually um, on um, experimental evaluation of cellular beams. So it is a, is a passion of all of ours and we are greatly appreciative of AISC for um, selecting us to do the design guide. Um, they did not tell us, however, when we started this that it would be like doing a doctoral dissertation and you can see the veritable who's who of steel people um, that were the reviewers of the technical guide um, and it was a very th thick set of reviews uh, for us to incorporate comments, but it, it really, I think, added to the, the technical content um, and the quality of, of the guide. I'm gonna, I don't wanna single anybody out, but I am gonna single out Steve Hoffmeister um, for Thornton Tomasetti. And uh, I asked him to send me some, some photos of his project that he had detailed at one of these conferences, and he couldn't find any. And so he sent me this, he goes, I found this when my first use of castellated beams, and his assistant is now 17 years old, so kind of dates uh, where, the, where the photo was, was taken. Um, in terms of castellated and cellular beams, castellated beams essentially are those with the hexagonal openings, and the cellular beams are those with the circular openings. And the procedures are a little bit different, um, very similar. Um, so as we go through today, we'll kind of separate out the two um, as, we, as we move forward. Uh, 
So I'm going to walk you quickly through um, the history, rationale behind them, and talk a little bit about castellated beams. And I'll turn the, the mic over to, to John to walk you through the cellular beam process um, and modes of failure or applications. And, and then Sam will take you through the rest. And ultimately, if we have time today, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of the research that we've done over the years. But in terms of where they originated, it was back in the 30s. So, it, you know, the idea behind this type of uh, steel beam isn't new. Uh, and basically in the U.S. it took about 30 years to get here. Um, they've never caught on widely and some of you in the industry know that there's some people that have produced them and then they don't and, and that's kind of waned and so the goal really with AISC is if we get a design guide out there, um, perhaps we could then um, have some, everybody manufacturing these. But you know, as, a, as an educator, you know, when, you, when you talk to the freshmen and sophomores and, and basically it's a, you know, if you're talking about moment of inertia and bending and deflection, right, and you see that BD cubed over 12 that's, you know, embedded in our minds, it's like, yeah, there's a cube on the D. So if we can increase D, we can do a lot in terms of bending. And that's really what happened is in terms of we can use the same amount of material, but we can increase the depth. Right? So we put a little up front on the, on the fabrication manufacturing side, but we can get a deeper cross section. Now, of course, we're going to introduce all sorts of different failure mechanisms that need to be checked, but trust me, the design guide will, will, will cover those. So in terms of the castellated beams, right, I said they were the hexagonal openings. Um, so you've got to cut that zigzag pattern into your beam. Now, we don't have internet connection for the computer up here, so I can't show you the video. Um, but you can imagine what that looks like, cutting it apart. And if we take a look at the fabrication, starting with that zigzag cut along the axis of the beam. Right? So you make this cut, and you've essentially turned your, your W shape into two pieces. Right? So we take the two pieces apart. We then stagger the pieces. Right? So we move them shift them down, we know we have a little bit of end waste, and ultimately we put the two pieces back together, right, creating a new deeper shape, right, so we start with a shape of D, we essentially keep the same beam, but have a different cross section, the same amount of material. So you're increasing your depth by about 50%, and again, that's the term that gets cubed when you're looking at your moment of inertia. Right, so our W21 by 44, for example, is transformed into what we will call for a castellated beam CB. So it's a CB 30 by 44, where 30 is our nominal gross depth, right, and 44 is the nominal weight per foot. So unlike traditional steel beams where D is D, um, there's some variability with castellated beams, right? So you could have a section, depending on how it's specified, of a 5.5 inch um, D top or D bottom, or you could go as high as six inches, right? Giving you a different gross depth, right? Sam will detail that later. Um, and then this is typically, we're gonna use symmetrical castellated beams when we have non-composite beam construction, right? So we'll have nice symmetry, same shape at the top and the bottom. Um, we do use a lot of these in applications that are composite, right? So we've got that nice big hunk of concrete at the top that we can carry our compression load in. Um, composite beam construction um, for castellated beams allows us to use a different bottom half, right? So we can use that green shaded area as a bigger beam, right? So for those asymmetrical castellated beams, we can combine, let's say, a 21 by 44 and a 21 by 50, and we would call that a CB30 by 44 slash 50, right? Where we use the 21 by 44 at the top, we use the 21 by 50 at the bottom, and now we have a nice asymmetrical castellated beam shape, right? Obviously, it's a little bit different in terms of how we're gonna put this together because we need two different types of beams, right? And essentially, from the smaller beam, you get two top pieces, from the bottom, from the bigger piece, you get two bottom pieces. Um, again, you get the same waste unless you specify an odd number of beams, and then you're left with an extra top or an extra bottom. So I'm going to turn it over to John and let him walk through a similar process for the cellular beams and talk you through some of the applications that we've seen. <laughs> 
Thanks, Dave. Okay, so I'm going to go through a similar set of slides for uh, how cell beams are created. And a cell beam is very similar to a castellated beam. Um, really, the main difference is in how it's cut and the resulting uh, hole pattern in the web. And you can see that um, doing a cell beam actually takes twice as much cutting. And the way it's done is you do the first cut, and you come back, and then you do the second cut. And then you can separate the two pieces, just like a castellated beam. But in a cell beam, um, you're left with a, a little bit of waste that, that comes out. And so you can see here's a, here's a cut section. And you see there's both passes and the, you know you could go down once and cut it and come back the second time and cut the, the, the other pass and then a little piece in the middle is what you're left with. And so I don't think we're going to have a video today. Uh, but you can see here's, here's two split sections and then when they're split they tend to kind of banana because the internal stresses and then you, know, you can set them back on the table and, and straighten it back out. And you can see here's kind of the separated T sections. And then, just like the castellated beams, we, we stagger them and weld them back together. And the, the pitch and the spacing tends to be a little bit different in a cell beam. And here's the waste again. You can kind of see what it looks like completed. And then again, uh, important for, really, the castellated beam makes the most sense when you're doing composite construction. And so, asymmetrical sections are a real advantage that you want to take, care of, uh, take advantage of. So the material remains unchanged. Now the way we designate these is a little bit different. Uh, they're called LBs. So this would be instead of a CB 30 by 44, being LB 30 by 44, and that just means cellular beam, 30 inches deep, nominally 44 inches deep, or 44 pounds per foot, similar to how wide flange is specified. And uh, the, the the size of the openings for a cell beam and the size of the openings for a castellated beam. They're quite different from each other. For a cell beam, the holes are generally round. They're perfectly round. And for a castellated beam, the, the holes tend to be taller and skinnier and pushed together more. And so when you're doing an equivalent uh, cell beam, it tends to be shallower and it, and it tends to perform not quite as efficiently in Virendale bending, which Sam will hit on here in a little bit. So that it's really a different kind of animal. They behave completely differently. Um, the ideas are similar, but the, the resulting uh, strength is, is really quite different from one to the next. And so you can see the, the, the resulting, just by changing the spacing by six inches, it changes the amount of waste that you get, you know, that you saw in the beginning. And so the, the, the depth of the beam can, can change quite a lot by as much as an inch. Okay, and so this is the equation, you know, this is, this is the quiz at the end if you come in late, so you have to memorize that equation. Sam's going to check to see if it's a plus or minus there. But that's the equation uh, for calculating the loss in depth uh, when, when the beam is cut. And, um, you know, it, it can vary anywhere from, you know, a quarter to up to an inch depending on the size of your beam, your spacing. And so it can be a significant loss uh, in, in, in strength it, when, it, when, it's, when it's taken into account. And so there's your, there's your loss that comes out of it. So the overall effect is that this is true for both castellated and cellular beams. The, the, the biggest advantage you have uh, from castellating a beam comes with the increase in stiffness. That's the single biggest advantage. And so when you're considering when to utilize these members and when not to utilize these members, think stiffness. If stiffness is important in what you're doing, uh, castellated beams probably make some sense. If they're short and stiffness isn't the overriding factor, it's probably not as efficient. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, we can also make the asymmetrical sections, and they're specified similarly to the castellated beam. You take a W21 by 44 for the top and a 21 by 50 for the bottom, and then you come up with an LB44 over 50. And that just indicates the 44 is the top weight and the 50 is the bottom weight. And then, um, you know, usually if you're designing an asymmetrical section, you know, you can be a good 20% heavier in the bottom section than in the top section. And that's usually a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, that's about where it ends up. Okay, so now we're going to talk about applications for, for a few minutes. And I think this is, as a practicing engineer, this is the most important part to me is, you know, when do you use this product? And I kind of alluded to earlier, you know, stiffness is the single biggest advantage you get from castellating a beam. 
you know, the fact that the depth has increased is also a, is also a, it's a big benefit, but it gets offset slightly by the fact that you introduce other stresses into the beam that you don't typically count on when you design a wide flange beam, you know, just straight M over S or M over Z. And so, you know, you want to consider castellated beams when you have spans that exceed about 40 feet, loads that exceed roof loads, you know, at least 40 to 100 pounds a square foot, and you want to consider them where you have, um, you know, heavy floor loads. And so, if you're going to go design this system with short span, you know, 25 foot spans, uh, you know, typical kind of thing that we do, um, you know, this is really more suited for a bar joist, you know, bar joist to two foot or four foot on center or something like that. So if you're going to take advantage of castellated beams, you really need to consider the way that you're going to frame it and you want your minimum span to be around 40 foot from a practicing point of view. It's not like you can't design efficiently at 35, but until you get to 40, there's not enough weight in the steel to overcome the cost of manufacturing. In other words, so if you're going to save 30% steel, if you start with a 14-pound beam and you save 30%, that's just not enough steel in order to make it worth your while. So you really want to start with something that needs to be about 40 or so pounds per foot, 40 foot long or something like that. And so when you do that, I mean, this is a, this is a trick we're all familiar with, you know, spread out your beams, span them out, or reduce erection pieces. And, you know, we find this is a, is a great way to save money. Um, you know, the, the, the old way of looking at things, of just looking at the tonnage of steel per square foot, I think is a little dated. Uh, you, you know, if you talk to erectors and fabricators, there's a massive amount of money tied up in just pure handling of pieces. And just comparing based on weight per square foot is really inaccurate. And so here's, a, here's a, you know, an example. And, and perhaps in that first example, we'd use bar joist or something like that. But this is really well suited to what we're talking about, going you know, to a composite system you know, with a 24-inch member, uh, we use an asymmetrical section, lighter on the top, heavier on the bottom, and then, you know, we've, we've, we've added a little weight, perhaps, but, you know, we've reduced the number of pieces almost by half, which is, net result is a savings. Uh, you know, personally, when we design, you know, my, my firm designs a lot of multifamily structures and then some bank buildings, and in bank buildings we find lots of times, you know, that, that kind of style of, of building, uh, you know, 50-foot spans are, are very, you know, they, they like that. They like to be able to double span with a single row of columns down the middle and, and eliminate those extra columns. And so here's kind of a, a standard plan, you know, extra row of columns. And here's, here's you know, what, we, what I think is a more efficient way to do it with a castellated beam. And, and if you're, like I said, if you're just going to go into this system and you're going to try to replace a W16 by 26 with a castellated beam, you're probably not saving any money. This is the way to take advantage of the product when you need longer spans and stiffer members. Okay, so you know when we do that, one of the one of the advantages of the castellated beams is also the holes in the webs, and we we, we have successfully taken into account the ducts passing through the um, through the web. You know we've we've done a lot of buildings where you know we we intentionally design holes and webs for use by the mechanical engineer, and you go out there and you know the mechanical engineer takes it up, and there's no room for the fire sprinklers or something like that, and you know, they, and despite your best planning of designing a system with, with holes in it, they all get used up and then you're kind of, you're left with nothing. In a castellated beam, the good news is you have a lot of members, or a lot of holes, and so you can take a, you know, bigger advantage of it. And so here's some pictures of, of that. And there's not a lot of planning around it. The holes are spaced where they're spaced, and there's enough room for, for a lot of services to go through there. And then, you know, for, for certain services, um, you know, we, we boxed out uh, two holes and then reinforced it like a Verendale opening and uh, been able to get big trunk lines through there. So like I said, uh, you know, this, I think these, this beam has a really good niche in the market in long spans and heavy loads. And so, you know, mixed use development, um, you know, when we're, we're, we do mixed use development quite a lot. And, um, you know, we, we really struggle with, uh, with, with, with the column spacing because the, you know, retail on that first floor doesn't jive out with anything above. And column-free space is a real, a real advantage there. <clears throat> so office buildings, I think this one was in England. And then healthcare too. In healthcare, lots of times the floors need to be, you know, stiffer than your average floor, so it makes sense there. And then parking structures. Parking structures are probably the, uh, 
single best example of a great application for castellated beams. You know, they naturally lay out the 60-foot spans. They naturally lay out the 8-foot spacings. They naturally want to be composite, and the composite action helps you with the, the durability of the deck as well. Um, personally, I found more advantages for using castellated beams in, in parking structures than I have in, in just about anything else. Um, so that's been, that's been, I think, the, the best example of, of a great application. I think when we first started doing parking structures with these beams, we went, you know, we did like a 4218 span and, and we found it was just cheaper to frame it like a precast would be done and, and just go with a 60 foot clear span. And um, I, I personally didn't do this job, but Sam was mentioning to me, he, he'd seen this, is that, you know, this is the, um, we do garages like this, we use PT beams and, and then, you know, 18 foot single span uh, PT deck. And, um, you know, Sam mentioned to me this job where they used the, instead of the PT beam, they used castellated beams and then the one-way PT deck between the beams. I believe this was in the northeast, wasn't it, Sam? Yeah. yeah. And then intumescent coatings have been pretty popular in, in these products. We also get a lot of exposed structural steel. And, uh, you know, when, when we get into that market, you know, they're... Um, Generally, the cell beams are more useful because the people find them more aesthetically pleasing. Natatoriums, long spans, uh, long spans in uh, stadiums, and then arches. Um, you know, arches. When, when you when you peel the beams apart, when you put them back together, you can naturally build a camber into them because the T's are somewhat flexible. So you can build arches into the castellated beams or into the cell beams. It does require a special the, the cutting pattern for the top needs to be done differently than the cutting pattern for the bottom because when you bend them around the holes no longer align if you don't account for that. But but it can be accounted for. You can you can do you know, impressive arch structures that way. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Sam and he's gonna kinda go through the design procedures. Thank you, John. I think this is the part I think most of the engineers are, have been impatiently waiting for. Um, I'm going to start off with the nomenclature for cassette beam. Dimension E is the length of the narrowest part of the web post or the length of the T section. S is the spacing of the opening, center, center. And this is the top T. This is the top web post. And the B dimension is the horizontal projection of that inclined part of the hole. And this is the critical section where we check the web post uh, for buckling. It's called H top. The angle phi for cassette beams is between 58 degrees and 62 degrees, and that's what everything is based on. So you cannot deviate from that. The bottom T and the bottom web post, and H bottom. And like they and John mentioned, the gross depth is about one and a half times the I-beam depth. Um, as in any design, there are geometric limits, which are different from the design limits, but that's the, that you have to observe or you must follow. You cannot you know, deviate from the geometric limits. For E, E has to be greater or equal to three inches. The height of the opening over E should be less than eight. And the E dimension over the web thickness should be less than 30. So that's the design basis. You know. And like I mentioned earlier, phi has to be between 58 to 62 degrees. For a cell beam nomenclature, the diameter, D sub O, 
the E dimension, similar to castellated beams. The center, center of the opening is S. Top T, right at the center. And there is another T section, which we call critical top T. This is where we check or calculate the section properties, and we, we check also the stresses. And it's at a distance of uh, 0.225, the diameter. This is the top web post. And there's also a critical section uh, for the web post at a distance of 0.45, the diameter. The bottom T, and also you have critical bottom T. The bottom web post. And like we did with cascade beam, there, there are also geometric limits that you have to respect. The spacing divided by the hole diameter should be between 1.08 and 1.5. And the gross depth divided by the diameter should be between 1.25 and 1.75. And E dimension should be greater or equal to three inches. So this is the geometric limits. So your design limits should be somewhere in between when you design the beam, but at least you have to meet that requirement at minimum. Okay, I'm gonna go through the load types and the global shear and moment. You simply can design the beam for any load type, whether it's uniform, non-uniform, like partially uniform, trapezoidal, concentrated load, axial loads, like along that drag line, and end and concentrated moment. And here's a picture of that. The global shear for uniform uh, loaded beam moment diagram for a uniform loaded beam. And what I'm showing here, it's quite different than a wide flange beam. In wide flange beam, you have the maximum moment, you know that, you have the maximum shear to design for it. But for castellated or cellular beams, you have to keep track of the shear and the moment at every opening and at every web post. And the reason for that, you have to look at the interaction between the moment and the shear at each opening. And I will touch on it in more detail later on, you know. So that's the extra work that you have to do. And this slide will sum up all the modes of failure. And later on, I will touch briefly on each one of them. But I think it should sum up all the forces and stresses that you will have to investigate. This is the beam. For illustration, I'm going to pick one hole. So you have a global moment divided by the effective depth. So you, you have a compression on top, uniform compression, tension on bottom. You have a net vertical shear. And the net vertical shear is what we had earlier, the global shear minus, if you have a composite beam, you have to take out the concrete shear strength, you know. But if you have a non-composite beam, that term goes to zero. And that shear, because two-thirds of the beam um, depth is an opening, so that shear has to be resist resisted by the top T and the bottom T. And with the shear being at a distance of E over two, that introduces a bending moment which we refer to as a very deal bending moment. So here now you have a uniform and uh, bending stresses, which may lead into yield or buckling of the T section and yielding of the bottom section. Also, as we have vertical shear, we also have horizontal shear at a distance of uh, the height opening over two, producing bending stresses in the web post, which may lead to web post buckling. 
And also, where you have your maximum reaction or your uh, maximum shear, you may have a uh, uh, web yielding at the fillet or web crippling along the web. Here's some pictures of the modes of failure. Web post yielding. And you can see with the web post buckling, there is a twisting that goes along with it. It's a bit different than the uh, web crippling. With web crippling, you see, you have just a local buckling. But with the web post buckling, you also you have a twisting along with it. You know. Here's a picture of a test that we did at Villanova. You can see how the web post buckled. Also, you could have a horizontal weld rupture along the weld line. So what are the limits state that needs to be investigated? I'm going to go through each one of them. Compactness and local buckling. Vertical shear at gross and net section. You're checking it for yielding. Horizontal shear in the web post. You also have to check it for yielding at the narrow section. Also, you have web post buckling. Very deal bending of the T's. Axial tension and compression in the T's. And the overall beam flexural strength. And also, if you have an unbraced length of the top flange, you have to check for lateral torsion buckling. Design codes, welded pair AWS D11, and also with the latest code of AIC 360-16. So now I'm going to go or touch briefly on each one of them. We're going to look at the vertical shear through the full section. Then through the net section and horizontal shear through the web post. The available shear strength is in accordance with AIC spec G2. And the shear strength must be calculated at the gross section to prevent web crippling, which is the local buckling, and also web yielding at the fillet. And I'm not going to go through the equations here, but I'm just going to show you for that check at the gross section, this is, you know, it's a function of the height of the beam divided by the web thickness. And here's the equation to follow. And in nominal sheet strength, you can see that 0.6 Fy dg times dw times the coefficient c sub v1. So now we're going to switch to the net section. The net vertical shear is proportioned between the top and bottom T's relative to their areas. So if you have a non-composite beam, you're simply looking at the shear split 50-50 between the two. But if you have a, non, uh, a composite beam where the bottom T is larger than the top T, more shear goes into the bottom T than the top T. So for net section, it's similar to what we did with the gross section, but now your uh, depth that you use in your check is the depth of the T section. And that's the equation you can see. It's similar to what we had earlier, but with the D top plus D bottom as your depth. Now the web post horizontal shear. The D effective. <coughs> You know, for a non-composite beam, it's simply the gross depth minus Y bar top minus Y bar. You can think of the T section as the top and bottom uh, cord of a truss, just to simpl uh, simplify it for you. The knowing the moment, the required moment, you know, from your design or the global moment divided by the effective depth 
It gives you the compression and tension forces in the T-sections. And now you have two op uh, openings side by side with two different compression forces or tension forces. This produces what? Horizontal shear. There are different methods to calculate, to calculate the horizontal shear, but we chose this method. It's very simple. Okay. What will this horizontal shear do? It will, could, you know, produce buckling in the web post. And like I said here, it's accompanied by twisting of the post. The web bo uh, post buckling strength equations were developed by Dr. Redwood at McGill University. What he did, he did the destructive testing and FE analysis, and he came up with some curves. And what I'm going to show you is the equations for those curves. It runs here at H. So this is the horizontal shear with a moment R of, uh, of uh, the height of the opening divided by two that produces your required moment in the web post. And this is the plastic moment capacity at the blue line. You can see the, the first part of the equation is your, your uh, plastic section modulus times Fy. And this is the research work that was done or performed by Dr. Redwood. And the equations I'm going to show you are the equations for the curves. Depending on your, the ratio of E over the web thickness, if it's 10, it's equal to that. If it's equal to 20, it's equal to that. And if it's 30, it's equal to that. But what happens if you're, the ratio that you're designing you know, for a beam that E over uh, the web thickness falls in between, so you can interpolate between the two values, you know. With the upper limit being the one, uh, the value for uh, E over T of equal 10. So that's your upper limit. But you can interpolate between the two values. So if you have 14, so it's between 10 and 20. And this is the available flexure strength for the web post. Now we're going to switch to cellular beam, and you can see the web post buckling with a twist to it. The web post buckling strength, it was uh, developed, the equations were developed by the Steel uh, Construction uh, Institute of England. The same thing, uh, they did uh, destructive testing and FE analysis. Now, knowing the forces in my T's and, uh, and the shear, the horizontal shear, at a distance, 0.45, the whole diameter that produces your moment or your bending moment in the web post. And that section in green, this is what the critical section is with a dimension like you see. The elastic moment capacity along that green line is basically your S times Fy. So we have two modes of failure. Could be flexure failure, where you develop plastic hinges in the web post, and buckling failure. The equations that, that was developed by the, the Steel Construction Institute of England, had, they did a parametric studies, and it was based on these parameters. The spacing over the whole diameter, the diameter over the web thickness, and also M allowable over ME, with ME being the elastic moment capacity, and M allowable is the moment allowed, allowed at the green line. With the assumption that part of the beam or the web post is rigid, 
So you have to calculate three constants, C1, C2, C3. This is C1 equation, you can see it's a function of the hole diameter and the width thickness. C2, C3, and you plug that all in in the equation to get the ratio M allowable over ME and with the allowable moment at the green line. And that's how you compute your available flexure strength in the web post. Again, it's buckling. LRD and ASD. Now, so we looked at the web post, the gross section, and the net section. Now we're going to focus on the T section, what's going on there. So you have an axial load in the T, and also you have very deal bending. So I'm going to look at the compressive strength of the T section above and the opening with the effective length K factors being Kx equal 0.65, so you're assuming it's fixed at both ends, and Ky equal 1. And with the L being the length of the T, E, dimension for cascaded beams, and for cellular beams, it's the whole diameter divided by 2. That's your L. And you simply follow the critical stress calculation in AIC, chapter E3. For Verendil bending, what is Verendil bending? It's basically you have a shear being transferred through the opening that introduces bending in the top and bottom tees. And by the way, in case you want to know, Verendil, uh, or Mr. Verendil, he was a Belgium engineer. And you might have heard of the Verendil trusses. Instead of using the usual triangular shape or openings, he was using rectangular openings in his trusses. And you can see, as a result of this Verendil bending, you could have, you could develop plastic hinges. And here's a picture of what does it look like. I mean, I'm showing it for cell, uh, cell beams in this picture, but you can see the, what's going on, you know, the four hinges. What is the required flexure strength? I'm talking about the T-section. Okay, like I said before, the shear, you have a net, net uh, vertical shear being proportioned between the top and the bottom T. You take that times E over 2. That gives you the required moment that the T section has to resist. And also, for cell beams, the moment arm is different. It's the whole diameter divided by 4. Now, for the flexure strength for top and bottom T, you use AIC sp uh, spec F91 for yielding and F92 for lateral torsion buckling. And, the, and then you compare the available versus the demand or required fl flexure strength. And now you have the axial loads, you have your bending moment, you simply apply the inner action equation, H11A and 1B. Now, for beam deflection, with the openings in the beam, the, it's basically due to the bending moment in the T's and the web post, so you have flexure deformation. And also you have axial forces in the T, so you have axial deformation. And shear in the T's and the web post, and you have shear deformation. So you have to add all that up together. And to simplify your life, I mean, instead of going and trying to cal calculate each one of them, because like what John said, you're using the beam for a long span, so your flexure deformation is dominating your deflection. You can use the, defle uh, the flexure deflection and time it by 1.15 to account for shear deformation, and you're done. <laughs>
the composite beams where we use asymmetrical sections. Okay, with non-composite beam, it's easy to calculate the effective depth. But for composite beam, you have to go through maybe three or four iterations before the, you know, your uh, effective depth converges. So in your first iteration, you're gonna assume your stress block in compression is equal to the thickness of the concrete with the effective depth being the gross depth minus Y bar uh, bottom and the height of the deck plus half of the concrete thickness. That's, so that's your effective depth for the composite section. That's your first iteration. Knowing that and knowing your required moment and by the way, I'm, I'm doing this at every opening. It's not like a, you pick one opening. You have to do this. I'm using this opening for illustration, but you have to do that check at every opening. So with the required moment divided by the effective depth, you end up with the, uh, the axial forces in the concrete and the bottom T. Now, you had your axial load from iteration one. Now, Knowing that, I'm going to take that force, go through my second iteration. That's my force T1 from the previous step divided by 0.85 F prime C divided by the effective depth. You end up with a new height or depth for the stress block. Now the new effective depth from this step is the same thing as we had before using the new depth for the stress block. And you can see now with the new force, I'm using my new effective depth from this step, and I have a new compression force and tension force. This subject is interesting because you're not gonna find it in the AIC manual. You know, with the wide flange beams, you simply, okay, I'm designing, this is, a composite beam, I can design it and calculate how many studs I need. With this, we have to do it in a little differently, you know, and I will show you how. Number of studs for full composite action, it's still based on the AIC, uh, the two limit that you have to check for concrete crushing and yielding of the steel, and you can see I'm using the area of the net, uh, the net area of the steel section, and in pair IIC, you take the minimum of the two. So your total number of studs is two times, V min being the minimum of the two from step one and two, divided by the, the stud sh uh, shear strength, that gives you the total number of studs. Now this is the new term what we refer to as the stud density over the beam length. It's simply the stud's shear strength over the entire beam divided by the beam span. So that we refer to that as Q, so it skips per foot. Now, to illustrate this method, you know, for illustration, I'm gonna pick the second opening but like I said, just because you say the beam is fully composite, it doesn't mean it's fully composite at every opening. Maybe as a whole it, it does. But at every, every uh, opening you have to check whether you have a full composite action or partial composite action. So I picked uh, opening two at a distance of 3.71. And Assuming it's fully composite at that opening, I have a force of 61.4, which is basically the required moment divided by the effective depth that we got from the last iteration. So we have C1, C, uh, T1. Now, the, the stud's shear strength up to that point, up to that opening, is Q, the stud density, times X, So uh, 82.4. Now I got enough studs, like it's 82.4, to, 
which is larger than the, my force, which is 61.4, that means I have a full composite action. When I have full composite action, I'm, it means I'm carrying the entire moment by the composite beam. So I have no additional forces going into the steel beam by itself, you know, as a non-composite. And I started off with 61.4, assuming it's fully composite, and I know it's uh, fully composite, I have 61.4. So there's no difference. The next example I'm gonna show you, if it's partially composite at that opening, going back to the second opening, assuming it's fully composite, I have 61.4. That's what you assume my stud shear strength, and in this example, I'm using uh, a smaller number for my shear, uh, for my stud density, so my Q is lower, and times X is 46.7. So you can see the compression force in the concrete is larger than the, what the studs can develop. Then I know I don't have enough studs to develop the full composite action, it means I have a partial composite action with the force uh, being Q X, uh, X because this is the largest force that the studs can develop. And knowing it's partial composite, what does it mean? It means if you look at the term in, re in the red box, that gives you the degree of composite action. So when you do one minus, it gives you how much of that moment, the, the total moment, how much of it is being resisted by the steel beam alone. And you time it by M, uh, the required moment, and you can see the effective depth is the, the steel beam depth. So that gives you how much of that moment or the global moment is being resisted by the beam alone. So now, you get 17.9 going to the top and the bottom. That's additional force. So assuming it's composite, I get 61.4, but I do end up, because it's partially composite, I end up with a larger force, 64.6. Connections. So now we're going to switch to connections. It's you're basically using the same connections that you do for a wide flange beam. You can see for this beam, the shear cap. In this beam, they're using uh, end plate connection. One thing, I, you know, you can see that where I'm pointing with the red arrow, it shows you, you have a beam framing into the cellular beam at an opening. So what the beam supplier has to do is to do a partial fill of the opening to accommodate the connection. And sometimes when you have high shear, you end up filling the, 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 the entire hole. So if you have a 40-foot beam, this is what you do. 160 bending stress checks, 72 shear stress checks, 26 web post buckling checks, Lateral torsion buckling checks, 100 deflection checks. So you're doing 350 calculations. Not too bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, comparing it with a wide flange beam, uh, you, you just maximum moon, maximum shear. But the good thing, you don't have to worry, there is a design software for that. So that's the good news. You know. Design tools. You might have heard of Bentley Ram S beam. That's one design tool that you can use, and I'm showing the graphics of the their design loads that you can apply. This is also a screenshot of their software for cellular beams. So this is a standalone program. So, and by the way, it's being updated. In, I think in April to the latest code just to make you aware of that. And this is for cast iron beams. This is a screenshot. The other tool is ram steel. 
So if you're laying out the whole building in RAM, you can do it also, you can pick castellated beams. And something I want to point out to you, you know, in RAM, uh, because I worked with RAM in, in developing this software, you know, you can see it, it specifies the whole diameter, like 17 inch, and with an S, the spacing between the holes, you have to give the beam supplier a range for the spacing, not one single spacing, because it makes it hard for him to, uh, to come up with a profile that fits between the beam length, you know. So you have to give him a range, and also it gives you the stud count. This is what this engineer did, you know, he called out the hall diameter and single spacing. That's something you shouldn't do. You should give a range for S's. And like what Dave and John also pointed out, the depth, when you say LB24, it's not 24, it could be plus or minus. So just to make you aware of that, and based on the spacing. Also, Dr. Murray, he did incorporate the, uh, the castellated beams and cellular beams into his vibration software. And there are 320 beam sizes that you can pick from for castellated beams and also 320 for cellular beams. That's combined, I mean, the non-composite or symmetrical and non-asymmetrical. Uh, so 320 of each. And as far as the manufacturers or fabricator, the one I know of in the States, Steel Fab out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, they are fabricating the castellated and cellular beams. Also in Europe, Arcelor, I think in Belgium, Weststock in UK. Now I'm going to switch it to Dave for research. All right, we've got a, a, a few more minutes before we open it up to, to, to questions. Um, and Sam referred specifically to some of the research that's been done um, in, in McGill, in Canada, um, and in the UK. I know in the last 10 years, um, this bullet item list has some has been done by manufacturers. Arcelor Mattel really did a lot on the fire protection side. Um, web post buckling analysis by Redwood, uh, numerous analytical models, both on the linear and nonlinear side. There's actually in the engineering journal um, last month, there was an article on castellated cellular beams looking at concentrated loads. So there's been a lot that's been done in the area. Um, one of the features that um, a couple of the reviewers actually noted that they were, they were pleased to see at the end of the guide, um, not only the references that we used within the guide itself, but supplemental references um, of particular areas that you may run across as you use the design guide. Some of the, the research that we've actually conducted at Villanova in the last 15 years, uh, we focused on some of the large copes at beam ends. Most of these actually resulted as issues of, as people were applying, doing some of those projects that John highlighted, um, questions that engineers came to us with. And uh, CMC and, and, and then, um, or SMI previous to that and CMC and New Millennium were, were proactive in, in investigating, going a little bit deeper into trying to understand what happened. But many of the factors that you see within the design guide, you know, as Sam's like 0.45 of the diameter, you know, where does that section come from? It really comes from research that was done, you know, years ago and, and, and some in recent times too. So I'm just going to give you some, some highlights. Um, all of the things that I'm going to talk about that we did at Villanova is all published. So you can go out and, and see that, that information. Um, but there were a lot of people that went into the research. Um, professors, colleagues of mine, uh, Sean Gross, Joseph Yost, and, and, and Becky Hoffman um, helped supervise all this with, along with myself. Our industry partners um, that funded the research were obviously crucial. Um, I don't know if anybody's here that's on the list, but oh, Tim's in the back. Um, but we've had a, a lot of partners along the way, and, and probably the most important partners are our graduate students. Um, it's great for all of us to come up with ideas, but somebody actually has to do all of this hard work. Um, and I think um, 
not to single anybody out, but there's a couple of red names. It was funny, Nicole was our very first graduate student that worked on cellular beams. So it was back in, I think it was 2000. And one of our undergraduate assistants, so he's a couple years younger, was Jason Hennessy. And so I think one of the best outcomes of cellular beam research um, was these three little girls. <laughs> um, and they, they pitched an idea. I haven't found anybody that would, is willing to fund it yet, but on a new pattern um, for a cell beam. So we'll, we'll see if we can get this one, well, this one off the ground. Um, but that first study was actually looking at, at that distance E prime that, that Sam highlighted and, and, and the effects and how did that interaction of, of buckling at that connection and the first web post. And so you've seen this photo before and trying to highlight you know, how, how big can that cope be um, before you start to lose some capacity. And so there's, there's some of that that's, that's out there published and was incorporated into the design guide. Um, almost all of the work that we did um, involved experimental testing, um, looking at analytical model, models that went, go back to the Blodgett book that most of us have on our, our desks. Um, and then you know, replicated with, with finite element analysis. You know, one of the, the studies that it's really started as an undergraduate project, but they were seeing a lot of use of shear tabs or single angles in the connections. It was, it was simply looking at, let's look at comparable beams, and the only thing we're going to change, you know, hold the loading and the length and the opening, everything the same, just go from single angle to double angle. And, and what's that impact? Is there a dramatic change in our stiffness? Is there a dramatic change in the way that the, the end of the member is going to buckle? Um, and the, the, the simple answer is there just isn't. I mean, you can see the design load here and, and how overstrength the beams were. Um, but there's, there's a slight change in the stiffness, not appreciable. Um, and you see a little bit of change in how it fails. Um, but again, nothing dramatic. As, you know, um, one of the studies, and this was actually presented back in the Steel Conference in Montreal um, a few years back. Um, we did a, a, some really neat stuff on looking at those critical sections. So there's, um, since some of the research was done so long ago, and you, you find this number, and you're like, where does that number come from? And it's not often easy to go dig it up. Um, but we did a, a, an interesting study where we, we, we just did some standard tests, and, but we used a tremendous amount of, of strain gauges. Um, it, it took way longer to get the gauge layout and figure out um, how those rosettes were working. But we did, um, and this pub was published actually in the engineering journal um, a few years back um, to figure out what are those critical sections. Um, do they change from cell to cell? Um, and comparing finite element model to um, the theory that Sam prevented that came out of England and what came out of um, Redwood's work uh, and looking at what we saw then experimentally. Um, through multiple samples. So there's a lot that underlies um, what is in the design guide from that. Um, and it's always easy to talk about the, the successes. Um, I'll just end on, on one that was a little bit of a failure uh, that we were looking at seeing could we, we apply um, seismic applications for cellular beams. You know, and, and my theory is my background's in structural dynamics was, wow, well, okay, we've got a reduced beam section. Right? So you got the dog bone, top flange, bottom flange, create that weak point in your beam that connects to the column. So essentially build in the fuse. So we know where it's going to fail. We know where we're going to get our ductility. You know, and the more I worked with the cellular beams and the castellated beams, and you see these, these failures, you're like, wow, there's a lot of ductility when you get this web post or this E prime buckling region. You know, could that be potentially our fuse that built in just when we use or select these types of beams. So the, the, the goal was to, to do um, some testing that, that met the seismic code requirements. Um, and we started by just isolating the beam. So if you, if you look at the setup and, and where we are connecting to the wall, it's just a, a cellular beam. And we're going to load the end and, and apply a, a cyclic protocol. Here's a photo that shows it a little better. Um, but we've just got a big, thick, three inch thick plate at the end of the beams. And our goal was to isolate what exactly, what's the ductility we're getting out of the beam, and does it change if we fill in that first opening? So that was, that was kind of our thought. And so let's put this big thick plate on the end, we'll, we'll bolt that up to our strong wall, and then we'll start pushing on the end using this test protocol, looking at you know, what our, our moment drift is, and say, 
you know, what do we what do we get out of the beam? Can we get those nice big fat hysteresis loops that we all hope for? Um, so came up with a good lateral bracing system and gauged the heck out of the beam. So we have rosettes in a lot of places, uniaxial strain gauges in some others, and we started running the test. And what ended up happening, as you can see, this is a complete test. Actually, we didn't get very far into the test. Um, and what we saw at pretty low displacements was that you were seeing exactly what we thought at first. Um, we saw a little bit of yielding in a couple of spots that, we, that the finite element models predicted, but we had a premature fracture you can see at the top flange there, and then on the next reverse cycle that went to a bigger displacement, we had a, basically a pullout fracture in the plate, um, which was something unanticipated to me at least. Um, but we saw some yielding in the top and bottom flanges, um, some typical yielding um, around the openings. So similar to what we would see in a regular, you know, you know, like point load or distributed load test, you know, those locations where we expected to see some yielding um, initially, we did, um, and we saw that along the first four openings. Um, so he's like, "Geez, something happened. What is up with this material?" And so we did some transverse and some through thickness samples of our three-inch thick plate, um, and did just some simple Sharpie tests on them, you know, expecting values, you know, 70s and above for everything. And those through thickness tests, if you look at the, the far right hand corner, the, the energy absorbed for the through thickness samples um, were like in one case below 10. Right? So there was, there was no toughness in the material. Now subsequent to this, some friends at Lehigh had pointed out they had similar problems with thick plate when it's not manufactured properly um, for that. Um, unfortunately, this was at the same time, as we mentioned, you know, some people manufacture these beams then they drop out, then they come back in, somebody else picks up. This was the time where um, CMC was getting out of the cellular beam business, so we didn't get to finish the testing and get to a point where we're actually testing the beam and the column. Um, so if, we always like to start with um, questions. If anybody wants to volunteer to sponsor their research, um, we're happy to entertain those thoughts. I can guarantee at least a couple of good basketball seats. Um, for those. But with that, I thank you guys for your attention. I bring up the other two speakers um, to answer any questions that you guys might have. Thank you.